last speaker is Ellen Dorsey, coming from the Wallace Global Fund. She has been an environmental and human rights activist for over 30 years. Let's welcome Ellen Dorsey. Good evening. So that was um, incredible to uh, follow such powerful women and a fantastic poet. It's really exciting to see all of you, the leaders of our climate movement today, leading in this campaign to divest from fossil fuels and reinvest and build the energy solutions of our future and the new economy that we will need to sustain our planet and ourselves. I first want to salute the incredible work of the Swarthmore students. I was uh, privileged to be here two years ago, I think, um, in an early uh, event that was held on campus after they launched their campaign. I also want to commend the work of the early Coal Divestment Coalition, the Responsible Endowments Coalition, Sierra Club, Green Corps, As You So, Energy Action Coalition, and of course 350 and Bill McKibben, but mostly all of you who have led your incredible campus campaigns and who will continue to lead your campus campaigns. And I am so, so inspired by what I saw today. Okay, so indulge me. Let me set the stage for a moment. I come to you this evening as a time traveler from a distant galaxy forever set in the frozen time of Earth mid-1980s. The Sex Pistols are playing somewhere, and someone is getting their mohawks spiked up for Saturday night. It's also a moment of great social upheaval, deep divisions on college campuses, and enormous ethical challenges that compel action. Okay, as hard as it is to believe, probably more for me than for you, I was once your age. I had my head shaved, and I was a student much like you on my college campus at the University of Pittsburgh. And as fate would have it, I got swept up in what for me was the overriding moral issue of the day, ending apartheid in South Africa. I joined the global movement working in solidarity for the rights of all South Africans. It changed my life. The movement changed the course of history. And seeing it all firsthand forever changed the way I looked at the world. And in many respects, apartheid feels, feels simpler, more easily solved than what history has heaped onto your plates, this climate debacle. I want to spend just a few minutes reflecting on this period, and not just to make myself feel young <laughs> or idealistic, because I am no less idealistic today than I was then, but the easiest reason to talk about South Africa and the struggle to end apartheid is the most obvious. It ignited a powerful global movement for divestment, one of the core topics that we're filling this hall with tonight. But it's more than just that single mechanism or frame that makes it relevant. A better understanding of the history of South the South African divestment movement will give us a deeper understanding of the history you are making today and the impact that you can have. And have no doubt, you are writing history. And history one day will return the favor as you tame the climate beast and make the world more sustainable and just. And we have absolutely no choice as, as the powerful women that preceded me just laid out. One of the common misunderstandings, actually, about the South African divestment movement was that it was started on college campuses. To be sure, students were among some of the first pioneers but it was a movement that began in the faith community, in particular churches, as well as in social justice organizations. The students, however, took the strategy to a whole new level. A second misconception is that it was primarily an economic mechanism or about bankrupting South Africa. To the contrary, at the core, it was really a political strategy. It was about splitting the political coalition that kept the apartheid government in power. Inside South Africa, that meant dividing the white population that benefited from apartheid. Internationally, that meant breaking a coalition of countries that either failed to act or actively supported South Africa because they too benefited from apartheid. And it was about a political strategy to change US policy. This third point I want to stress is very close to your situation today, our situation today. 
activists in the United States took the divestment because their own government would not budge on sanctions against South Africa. <laughs> Congress was deadlocked by the interests of U.S. corporations whose profits were tied to the problem. Sound familiar? We'll return to this. Faced with systemic segregation, racism, and human rights violations by a white minority, South Africa's democratic movement called on the world community to impose economic sanctions. The call for sanctions was met with success in key countries, notably Northern Europe, but not in the United States. Why? Incredible pressure was brought to bear on the U.S. government by NGOs, church groups, labor, all calling for sanctions. Got little traction. Com companies invested in South Africa launched a massive lobbying campaign with huge financial resources. Sound familiar? to capture the political process, lock it up on their behalf. Faced with failed efforts at influencing government policy, divestment became the way for us, for activists to go. Take it right to the companies. Take away their social license to operate in South Africa. So I led the divestment campaign on my campus. And let me tell you how we were treated. First, we were told to stick to our studying. As students, how could we have a sufficiently sophisticated understanding of university investments? They were too complex, we were told. And there was no way to disaggregate a subset of investments in South Africa. Next, we were told that if our university divested, it would be futile. We could not hope to impact the companies economically at all, since they had, would not withdraw from lucrative activities. And our efforts would only be a drop in their financial bucket. Finally, we were told that a radical screen on investments would damage the university's portfolio performance, and that the university lost money, so too would we, either in programs, academic programs, services, or scholarships provided. Sound at all familiar? Wrong then, wrong now. We faced committees to study the issue with big name faculty placed on them. Some of them coincidentally were up for tenure or promotion and legions of investment professionals who were determined to shut us down. But we persevered. We educated ourselves about investments, something none of us had. We built shanty towns. We held rallies outside of the investment committee meetings. We placed students on these committees. We sat in on the chancellor's office and we built alliances with nearby churches and social justice groups to stand with us on campus. We power mapped our university's trustees' relationships with companies in South Africa. And in the case of public universities, we trace those relationships to campaign donations for state legislatures who allocated funds to the university. And we called those relationships to account. And lo and behold, we began to win. Universities divested, pension funds divested, churches divested, and my University of Pittsburgh divested. But the U.S. government had to take notice, and so had to respond to pressure for sanctions. The pressure intensified on the South African government, and the white government was compelled to begin negotiations for a real democracy. And in 1994, shocking, isn't it, enfranchised all South Africans. The, US's, the U.S. activists had actually created something really new, innovated a strategy, this divestment strategy. And with it, birthed a whole new socially responsible investment movement. Okay, enough of the history, back to the future. 30 years later, what does this Polaroid snapshot from the past tell us about where we are today and where we are headed? What's similar, what's dissimilar? Similarity number one, can there be any doubt that global climate change and the death and disruption it is entailing and will continue to entail is the overriding moral and ethical issue of our day? Certainly there are others, but virtually every other socially progressive cause or endeavor will sink or rise with our ability to keep the planet's life support systems safe. This is not just an environmental crisis. It is also a human crisis. It is a human rights crisis. Disease, famine, water contamination, destruction of livelihood, all of those add that to the unprecedented human toll of so-called natural disasters. 
the health toll from coal alone is considerable. Asthma, developmental disorders from mercury and water, cancers, all come at considerable cost to our society. And the economic cost is exorbitant, costing us billions to address these disasters and the health crisis and the health cost of the disease. And yet, the fossil fuel business model is conveniently externalizing those health, mitigation, disaster preparedness, and environmental costs onto society, onto us. They don't pay for these impacts and outcomes, we do. So have no doubt this campaign, just like South Africa, is based on a moral imperative to defend our planet, our lives, and the future for my child, your children, against fossil fuels. Similarity number two is the lock that the fossil fuel industry has over government. We have spent years trying to build political will for serious climate change policy, and it has failed time and time again. Like economic sanctions against South Africa, the policy option is not currently available to us. Shut down by corporate lobbying, disinformation, climate change isn't real. Oh my God. And the near capture of our democratic system. Subsidies flow disproportionately to fossil fuel companies, while their campaign contributions and super PACs support candidates in both parties to ensure their loyalty. National security is disingenuously pitted against progress, jobs against survival. Once again, it is time to loosen the political grip that industry has on our government and use the levers at our disposal to call out their culpability for climate change. We must identify them as the moral pry of our time and move towards the solutions that will save this planet, and that is energy conservation and renewable energy. You know this. I'm not saying anything you don't know. <laughs> Final similarity. Universities are again a critical actor. With $350 billion in investments, with $10 billion or more worth of stock in fossil fuels, and countless more in alternative funds, their investments are part of the problem, and potentially part of the solution. So what's different this time? While we called apartheid a moral outrage and asked our universities and pension funds and endowments to get out of companies benefiting from that system of racism, it was basically a call for disassociation. But in this campaign, divesting from fossil fuels, we can also call for reinvesting in the solutions, to put money and put strategies into growing the conservation and renewable energy that we must have to solve this crisis. So you can be asking your universities to invest in the jobs of the future, the jobs for many of you in this room, the technologies that we will inevitably need to reduce consumption and sustainably replenish our energy. Okay, now I'm gonna do something. Scott, I need my slide. Ta-da! But make no mistake, number one, Calling out the industry's responsibility for climate change is a moral imperative. If you own fossil fuels, you are climate change. But equal to the ask for divestment is the ask, I believe, for investment in green solutions, clean solutions. Take a look at the image behind me. Calling for green investments is part of the solution. We can have our universities, our churches, our hospitals, our foundations, move their money out of the problem, and seed solutions. Um, one point I want to stress tonight is that divestment is often seen as kind of the bad cop, the part that really takes it to the fossil fuel industry, challenges their cabal, their access to capital, their risk rating, and ability to do business. And to some extent, that is absolutely true. But what is crucial is that the reinvestment side has a big impact as well, economically. Moody's, the preeminent Chris credit risk agency, recently released a port on the, report on this point, and I want to read you a short summary that appeared in Business Green. Global credit risk agency Moody's today released a potentially explosive new report, warning that the credit quality of European thermal power plants will continue to be damaged as a result of the continent's switch towards more renewable energy. Hence, moving to renewables weakens fossil fuels economically. Now imagine if your university put a minimum of 5% of its investments into green. Let them figure it out. Some combination of clean tech, public funds, and private equities, and then directly into your own campus through a revolving green loan fund. 
They will be investing in the jobs of your future. They will grow the industries that will solve the global climate crisis. And if every university represented here tonight invested in a green loan fund on your campus, you would reduce energy consumption, you would grow demand and market for green technologies, you would create jobs for your community through a retrofitting and solar installation, and your university would make a significant pro profit. The average return on investment on a green loan fund is 28%. That's an awesome investment. That is also reducing your energy costs, thereby lowering your operating budget. Decrease energy, save some bucks, help your community, no brainer. So taken together, divestment and reinvestment will have three significant impacts, social, economic, and political. First, you're building a movement. It's here today, unlike anything we have seen in three decades. 250 campuses strong. You will then lead the churches and the pension funds to follow suit. And you are doing so in partnership with and in solidarity to, to the, those on the front lines of the climate struggle, those whose mountains are being blown apart, waters ca contaminated with chemicals, and lungs filled with particulates. And you are strengthening the socially responsible movement, investment movement as well. Bigger, stronger than anything we have seen in the past, and quite frankly, anything I've seen in decades, and it's exhilarating. Secondly, you're changing energy economics. Investment in green will build the renewable sector, lower the credit ratings of the fossil fuel sector. You go grow demand for energy solutions, conservation and renewables. Conservation, more important than the renewables. Finally, perhaps most significantly, as you build the movement and shift the markets, you are building momentum and you are building a powerful constituency for political change. You are weakening the grip of the fossil fuel lobbyists on our political process. I'm gonna say that again. You are weakening the grip of the fossil fuel lobby on our political process, and it's only then that we are going to be able to think about putting a price on carbon and that is the only way that we are actually going to get out of this mess, is by, by putting those costs back on those who incurred it. Okay. I'm close. I'm so close to wrapping up. Have I exceeded my time? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm close. So this weekend, you're getting ideas. You're sharing strategies, and you're building network connections, and you're building networks of allies that, quite frankly, I can honestly tell you, you will find ways to work with or come into contact with the rest of your life. I still see people that I was involved with when I was your age in the South African movement, and we didn't even have email. Think about that. No email. No computers. That's how old I am. Um, so gather the facts, gather the data, gather the strategy and tactics you need. Innovate. This may not work for you, this, this, this flow chart. This is my conception of how we can build power and bring about policy change. Some of you may focus on a subset of fossil fuels. Some of you may focus more on com the community reinvestment piece of the kind of reinvestment side of this. Bring in community allies. Stand in solidarity with other activists calling for high-quality jobs, but act. And don't let them tell you that they have one nice little investment in green, and that's good enough. They must get out of fossil fuels and get into the future. <clears throat> so let me end on a note of accountability. What am I doing about it? I run a foundation. Here's how it works. We have money that's invested. And with a percentage of that money, we make grants to, in our case, environmental and human rights groups. Four years ago, my foundation, we began to break down the wall between the investments on the one side, which is how most foundations work, and the grants over here. And we asked ourselves, are we walking the walk? Are we advancing climate change, or are we advancing the solutions with our investments? <clears throat> and we built a whole new investment strategy. It's still a work in progress, but at this point, we've moved more than 95% of our investment portfolio into funds that are screened, 
almost completely out of fossil fuels, along with we have many other environmental and human rights screens. And we have, I actually think it's 5.5% of our investments in clean tech solutions. We, thank you. And it, I'm telling you, it, it's not been that hard of a process to do this, but it required us just saying we were going to dig deep and we were really going to look at where we had placed our money and whether those companies were companies we could stand by on a value basis. And we, we began to purge. Nope, can't be that. We got out of coal first and immediately. We got out of oil next. And we're, we've got a few, just a handful of little companies, and hopefully we'll be done very soon. We take seriously that our values must be reflected in our investments, and we're experimenting on how to do that. But here's the good question, or the important question for your investment committees. How have we done? Are we making money? And I am happy to report to you that last year we beat our benchmarks and by a substantial margin, and we are growing at a clip of close to 12% in our investments. So we're doing good by doing good. Now maybe next year we won't, and I can't predict that we will continue to beat our benchmarks, benchmarks and do well. We're committed to what the path we have chosen, and we will sustain that path and believe that as a mission-driven, a public benefit institution, that is our responsibility. It is our mission to make sure that we do good with our investments um, and do the right thing by our investments. So now I go out and I talk to other colleagues, other foundation CEOs and trustees, and say, look, you at least have to have a theory about your values and your investments and what you own and whether it's consistent with what you're funding with your grant dollars to combat climate change. And if you are funding in the field of climate change and you haven't looked at your investments to determine whether you have fossil fuels, then you actually own climate change. So at an absolute minimum, you have to have that di dialogue. Particularly, foundations and universities should do no less. We are public benefit mission-driven institutions for education, and in the case of foundations, for promoting the social good. Why are we not asking whether our investments are contributing to the social good and addressing the most significant social and environmental crisis of our lifetime? So it's no exaggeration to say, it's no exaggeration to say that um, our future really is in your capable hands. And I have to tell you, today was truly exhilarating to be with you. I, I was astounded by the, the dialogue and the thoughtfulness and the strategic questions and the way that you're strategizing about how to support each other's campaigns on campuses. And for that, I am truly grateful. And on behalf of my daughter, I commend you. You are just the latest and most inspiring in a long and distinguished history of socially progressive movements. And I know, standing here tonight, that you will win. I do. So, as I stand in solidarity with you, let's do this old school. Let me ask you, will you stand in solidarity with frontline communities? Yes! Will you stand in solidarity with each other? Yes. Will you go back to your campuses energized? Yes. Will you commit to recruiting at least 10 new students to your group on campus? Yes. Did I say 10? How about 20? Okay. Will you commit to forming a relationship with at least five new allied organizations? Okay. Are you going to repay our global climate debt? Yes. Are you going to win on your campus? Yes. Are you building a new climate justice movement? Yes. Repeat after me. Climate justice now. Climate justice now. Divest now. Divest now. now. Climate justice now. Climate justice now. Divest now.